second section, the second uh, part of the lecture series, uh, we'll be dealing with especially the uh, very violent spillover of European wars into the North American continent, how this uh, affects the American colonists, but then also the run-up after the series of uh, wars of empire into the beginning of the American Revolution. And so at the beginning of this, we'll see the Americans sort of uh, fighting other Europeans uh, on behalf of Britain, and by the end, we'll see them fighting the British uh, on, on their way to uh, declaring their independence eventually, uh, but the fighting will start first. So <clears throat> if we had talked before about how our major sort of European colonists thus far in North America were first the Spanish uh, in the Caribbean and then Central America, Florida and South America, and then the next major ones are the English, uh, mostly along the eastern coast uh, of North America. Uh, our new entrant here into this uh, is going to be uh, France, right? And so really the, the, the dominant sort of opponent for English colonization ever increasingly after 1588 when England defeats Spain, battle of the Spanish Armada, uh, becomes France. Uh, France becomes kind of England's number one enemy for control uh, of North America. We won't talk about sort of all of the, the wars of the empire that spill over here into uh, North America. Uh, so there are a couple of these sort of uh, imperial wars that take place uh, in Europe and there's concomitantly a great deal of kind of swapping that of land in North America that takes place. Just like uh, the King of England used Pennsylvania to pay off William Penn for a debt, uh, we would see that when these uh, European powers would go to war with each other, sometimes they would use their uh, colonial holdings overseas as kind of bargaining chips. Hey, I'll, I'll give you this instead of having to pay you for that, or you took my thing over there, I took yours, so let's just swap. Uh, so that kind of thing is going to take place. So eventually, long story short, we're going to see that France is going to be the holder of a huge swath of territory uh, in North America, basically from the territory around the St. Lawrence River in what is now Canada, uh, through the Mississippi Valley, all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. And so for those of you who have ever wondered, well, how come New Orleans has such a French flavor? It's for a, because for a long time, it was a uh, French colony, right? Now the problem uh, with this for uh, the British was one that was somewhat strategic and somewhat economic. Uh, you're going to see the strategic problem is it basically cuts England's North American's holdings in half. Uh, English explorers uh, of the Hudson Bay Company had kind of uh, laid claim to what most is the sort of the, the tundra parts of uh, Canada, and they would really like to hang on to that. And then, of course, they've got a great deal of colonial activity in their three kind of major colonial areas uh, on the east coast of North America. And this is sort of cut uh, in two by the French holdings uh, from New France, what is now Canada, all the way down to the Louisiana Territory. And so the economic problem with this is uh, England would like to be able to exploit this in the same way that France is for monetary reasons. So from an imperial kind of standpoint, you can see why England uh, would have a problem with this development. Now, if you look at it though from the point of view of the American colonists, they don't like this very much either. One, it puts a potential enemy who is very friendly with the Indians right on your border. And we've seen that the uh, American colonists and the American Indians uh, do not exactly have uh, a great relationship with each other, one that is usually pretty bloody uh, in a lot of ways. But more importantly, this checked uh, advancement of Americans into the Ohio River Valley. All right? And by this point, a lot of Americans have kind of reached the, the line of the Appalachian Mountains uh, the Adirondacks, you know, the, that, that kind of line, and we're ready to kind of spill over that and into this territory. And a few sort of feeler kind of uh, activities, sort of the lonely kind of mountain men type of people were in this area already. But in terms of large-scale colonization, a lot of these people wanted to go into this area around the Ohio River, uh, and they were being stopped because this is French territory. So if you're an American colonist, and by now, by the time you get to the 1700s, you're dealing with almost 100 years, in some cases, of colonial activity where these people are you know, sort of moving and farming and uh, clearing land ever to the westward, and now you've reached this barrier to where, oh, we don't look like we're going to be able to do that anymore. This is going to be a significant social problem uh, and economic problem for American colonists beyond just the, well, you know, this causes problems for our empire. Not a lot of the local American colonists are probably too concerned about that. So we've talked about the Spanish their methods for colonization, we talked about the English and their methods for colonization, our third and final entrance uh, in terms of uh, colonizing North America and their approaches towards it is going to be the French, right? Uh, and the French provide us a third sort of definitive kind of look at, well, how do you colonize a new continent? 
How do you how do you do that? Right? Uh, explorers like LaSalle, Champlain, some of the other ones that are coming into this area, uh, are very, very different than the Spanish who viewed uh, their role as conquerors. They're going to come in, they're going to take over the area, they're going to take over the people, and they're going to be the new sort of overlords of the area. They also differ from the English, which sort of come in, claim the land, they want to use the resources, they want to set up new societies, and the old societies that were there, the American Indians, you guys shoot out of the way, right? Uh, the third approach to this is sort of a co-option method uh, of the French, where they want to come in, and they don't bring, typically, a huge numbers of colonists, although the, some of their colonies are, are fairly large. Uh, they, they claim the land, they build these forts, but they're mostly interested in trading with the Indians, uh, rather than straight up uh, outright conquest. Right? And so the Indians, generally speaking, are going to have uh, a much more friendly response to the French. Now, that doesn't mean that the uh, Indians are always going to get along with the French, and they've always got this happy-go-lucky kind of attitude. But our picture at the bottom here of sort of the happy French trader sort of laughing as he's showing off his wares to the Indians is actually pretty indicative of a lot of what was going on. And since the French colonies tended to have fewer settlers, smaller settlements, and took up less land space, they were the ones that tended to upset the Indians uh, the least of all. So as a result of that, you're going to see a pretty tight relationship uh, between the uh, northern tribes of the American Indians with the French rather than with uh, the English. And a lot of cases, too, at this point, uh, the Indians are probably looking at this and saying, okay, we've got a seriously uh, problematic issue right in front of us, which is, you know, we get these invading Europeans, and we've got to try to make some kind of survival, you know, uh, idea, strategy for, for ourselves. It looks like the only way we're going to be able to do that is kind of pick one of these guys to, to back with, because the idea that we're just going to sort of get rid of all of these European colonists, that's, that's not likely. Uh, that's, that's, not a good, uh, that's not a good way to go with this. It just doesn't seem like it's going to happen. And so uh, for these guys, you know, the Huron and some of these other uh, tribes, they are going to side with uh, the French as a result of their better relations with that as well. We're going to see that a lot of these European wars that are going to take place uh, on the continent of Europe are now going to spill over into the colonies. And so if you're uh, in England and you go to war with France, and so you're English, and now you're at war with the French, and so you meet French people on the high seas or on the battlefield, you fight each other. Okay, fine, right? Uh, that's sort of an understandable kind of thing. But when you transport that political reality across the Atlantic Ocean to North America, if you're living in an English colony, and England and France go to war, then the French people that are in the French colony right next to yours, you're at war with them as well, because they're French, just like you're English, regardless of the fact that neither one of you is in England or is in France. Uh, and so as a result of that, these political uh, happenings uh, in Europe are going to spill over into the colonial holdings uh, in North America. You see a similar kind of thing take place uh, in World War I, where these uh, African colonies uh, sort of go to war with each other because Europe decides to go to war with itself. Uh, generally speaking, what we're going to see throughout much of this period, uh, the late 1600s and early 1700s, is you're going to have France, Spain, and the French uh, allies among the American Indian tribes they're going to be on sort of one team, and generally speaking, you're going to have England armed with also her colonists uh, in North America on the other side. And this period is marked by really, really brutal uh, styles of warfare. Uh, you've got the frontier raid uh, that takes place time and again, where you know some of these uh, towns and villages and some of these outlying settlements uh, you know, are pretty isolated. Uh, the Indians are going to get into their war parties, and a surprise is one of the major tactics that you're going to use to try to get advantages on these people. And so, you know, attack these outlying farmhouses. Uh, if you can get in without getting shot then, and take these people by surprise, you know, you slit a lot of throats, you take a lot of scalps, uh, you take what's valuable, you burn the place down. Uh, women and children generally are sort of hauled off uh, into slavery. So it's, uh, it's pretty bad stuff uh, for these guys. And, and then, of course, the reprisals of the colonists against the Indian tribes, they're pretty brutal and nasty with, you know, mutilated bodies, and it's just it's really not very pleasant kind of stuff. And uh, I've long contended that nothing explains warfare quite like plastic soldiers, uh, which validates, you know, sort of a large part of my childhood. But uh, this gives us a pretty good idea. You know, you're uh, out at your farm, and then all of a sudden, ooh, the, the Indians are attacking, and they're coming through the wheat field or whatever. And uh, these guys have got to fight them off. Women and the children, you can see, are kind of fleeing, trying to get away from the scene. And either these guys hold the Indians off, or they die. So it's, it's really not, uh, really not 
too many uh, possibilities here for what's going to take place. And so the Indians you'll also notice for the most part are armed uh, with firearms. Uh, this is of course going to be supplied by uh, French traders who find it in their interest to be arming the Indians so that way they can be much more effective soldiers against England's colonists in North America. The Indians would take a lot of these captives when they would grab a hold of them, this was especially true for women, uh, back to Canada. Uh, sometimes they would make them their wives, sometimes they would sell them to slavery, uh, so uh, it was uh, pretty rough stuff. All right? Now as a result of that, the colonists feel like they kind of got the sword of Damocles, you know, just over them. They're waiting for the other shoe to drop. They're waiting for the hammer to kind of fall on them. Because the presence of the French in Canada is this one of constantly stirring up the Indians against them. And <clears throat> like I said, you know, when the Indians sort of attack, you know, when they have disagreements, it's a lot of dead colonists. So this is, this is a really palpable, conscious kind of threat of the presence of New France uh, in Canada. Eventually, we're going to get uh, one of the big kind of blow off, one of the, the, the watershed kind of events is going to be one of the, one of the best named wars uh, of all time. Uh, we started running out of good names for wars when we got about to the 20th century. You know, the World War, and then, well, it's one, and then we got two, I guess. So we've got that sort of movie sequel, you know, phenomenon now. Uh, they had much cooler names uh, back here in the 1700s. Uh, the War of Jenkins' Ear. <laughs> Uh, this was a European war that was begun uh, at least near North America. And <clears throat> what happens here is a British sea captain, they're sailing along, uh, and then his uh, merchant vessel is stopped by a Spanish naval vessel. The Spanish naval officers, they all come aboard, and of course the Spanish, they're a warship, they've got the guns, and the British sea captain, you know, oh, you can't, you got no right to do this, I'm just a merchant guy, and we're not smuggling, and you guys... We're not pirates, and so anyway, it was one of those kinds of deals. And the Spanish naval officer, they, there's a little back and forth between them. Uh, of, you know, you guys are awful, and you know, your teeth are crooked. I don't know, whatever you say to English people to make fun of them. And so anyway, uh, this argument sort of gets out of hand, and the Spanish naval officer cuts off this British sea captain's ear. And he tells him, he said, if your prince was here, you know, I would do the same thing to him. Which, you know, implying that, hey, if the King of England was here, I'd cut his ear off, too. Which, I guess, speaks to Spanish thoroughness. I don't know. Anyway. Well, <clears throat> uh, Jenkins, who has his ear cut off, right, uh, does what any of us would do in this sort of situation, which is he keeps the ear and then presents it to his leader. That's what I'd do. I'd take my ear to the President of the United States and I'd say, hey, here's my ear. This other guy said that, you know, your ear's next, bro. So anyway, uh, <clears throat> The English king takes this Spanish naval officer's word for it that he would, in fact, cut his ear off. Uh, of course, this all is extremely ridiculous. In fact, there was a whole host of political rigmarole all behind the scenes. And uh, this was just an excuse to fight a war uh, between uh, Britain and Spain. They had been sort of broiling for quite a while. So <clears throat> this is going to touch off a war uh, that does, of course, bring in now everybody else. Spain's ally, because Spain realizes that they probably can't take on England by themselves, is going to draw in France. And of course, France very much wants to strike a blow uh, at uh, England in their overseas colonies. And of course, England is very interested in enlisting the aid of their American colonists to help them fight this war. Uh, this, is a, this is pretty crazy kind of stuff. Uh, the Georgians are going to attack the Spanish uh, here in Florida. Uh, they're going to attack St. Augustine. They're going to be sore. Uh, rebuffed by the uh, Coquina uh, Fort at, at St. Augustine. They're not going to be able to penetrate its walls because the, the, the Coquina Rock is actually a lot softer than granite that you might find in other castles. They are going to then retreat uh, to one of the sea islands of Georgia where the Spanish are going to attack them. They're going to repulse the Spanish in a land battle. Uh, so it's a lot of back and forth between Georgia and Florida. But eventually we'll see that neither side gains uh, the advantage uh, there in that part of the war. Now, uh, through much of this uh, fighting, the American colonists are serving in a militia, which is sort of like our National Guard if our National Guard didn't really ever practice much. Uh, the militiamen there, they, 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 don't, they don't soldier all the time. They, they get these words, you know, from uh, you know, the British monarchy, hey, you guys got to serve, we're at war, you know, we're calling up the militia. Okay, fine, they grab their musket or hunting rifle or squirrel gun or whatever it is that they've got, the best that they have available, uh, and they appear. And so through much of this, uh, you know, they behave exactly like you expect soldiers who don't practice a lot to behave, which is they, they ran off. 
<laughs> they run off a lot. They get shot at and they run away. Uh, <clears throat> but eventually they kind of get their act together. And uh, a large group of New England militia and British regulars are going to attack Lewisburg. Right? And this is in what is now Canada. And Lewisburg, this, uh, this operation to take Lewisburg, uh, is really impressive because Lewisburg is an extremely sensitive, crucial, strategic point. It's at the mouth of the St. Lawrence River, so it's a very commanding strategic location. But in order to attack it, you've got to engage in an amphibious assault. And until we start dropping you know, soldiers from space or something like that, uh, amphibious assaults are the most difficult to coordinate in terms of uh, military uh, tactics because of the fact you got to get all these soldiers on, onto a great big boat and then off the great big boat onto these smaller boats and then you got to get them all to the shore in some kind of organization. At this point they're starting to get shot at and then get them off the boats onto the beach where of course they're now getting shot at a lot into some kind of order and organization and then attack a fort which is always difficult. So uh, this was pretty uh, pretty chaotic kind of stuff. There, there's plenty of opportunities for things to go badly wrong. Uh, with this, especially dealing with the fact that a large part uh, of the force of these New England militia. But, they succeed. These guys, they get their act together, they get out of the boats, they get on the shore, they take the fort at Lewisburg, and you know, hooray! Right? They get this back, they actually did something right for once. Right? But, when the war winds down, they get together at this peace conference and they say, okay, uh, let's start swapping little poker chips around the board. Uh, now that this is all over, and in the peace talks, the British wind up giving Lewisburg back to the French as part of a deal to get something that else. And so when you look at it from the big picture, you say, okay, well, that kind of makes sense. You know, all right, I see what's going on here. To a lot of these Americans, they feel really jilted. We fought. We actually did something right. We risked our lives. A bunch of us got shot so that you could give it back to the French at the peace conference. We, we don't really understand that. So there's a lot of bad feelings that are going to elicit uh, as a result of that, right? Uh, <clears throat> some of you may recognize our, our photo here on the slide. A lot of you are saying, oh, it looks sort of like the $1 bill, except he, he looks like he's in a lot better shape. Yeah, this is a young George Washington, and like a lot of your great military leaders of the late 1700s and the early 1800s, he had a really itchy chest. You see these guys, they get painted because they're, they're scratching their chest. Actually, I don't know why they're doing that. It's just sort of the popped collar uh, of uh, that period. These guys, you know, they thought it would look cool to stick their hand in their shirt. I guess better than sticking their hands in a lady's shirt. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> the question here that's going to take place uh, of our next sort of major colonial conflict uh, is going to be over the Ohio River Valley. And that's going to lead us to the Seven Years' War, uh, which is what they called it in Europe, or what uh, a lot of Americans called it, which is the French and Indian War. And if the War of Jenkins' Ears is, is a pretty big war, there are a lot of uh, imperial wars that have taken place uh, prior to that. The French and Indian War is kind of the big blow-off you know, uh, battle that takes place. For those of you who, you know, you watch a lot of pro wrestling, the two guys, they kind of go at it in these little matches before, and then eventually at the big pay-per-view, they have their big blow-off match. The French and Indian War is the big blow-off match for control of North America. Uh, the winner is going to escape with control of basically the entire continent, or at least most of it, and the loser is going to be sent off to kind of lick their wounds, right? Now, the immediate question, though, is going to be over the Ohio River Valley. The Americans, especially the American colonists, they want to settle in the Ohio River Valley. They are really ready by the time we get to the 1750s. They're ready to kind of leap over the uh, continental divide, and they're ready to move into this area of what is now Ohio and Kentucky, start farming, raising horses, I don't know, corn mash, whiskey, you know, whatever it is that you know, people like that did for fun back then. So they want to settle. They want to move into this region. But the French cannot allow this. They have a pretty good colonial activity going on in the north around the St. Lawrence River Valley in what is now Canada. They've got a lot of activity. They've got a decent number of colonists there. They've got a lot of activity going on in New Orleans where they've got a lot of colonists. They've got a lot of economic activity, but not a lot in between. They technically have Ohio, and they've got a few colonial sort of creepy weirdo French people that are hanging out with the Indians in the area, but not nearly enough to defend it other than the Indians themselves. But if they allow the American colonists, and thus the English Empire, to move into that area, then it's going to cut their colonial holdings in half. So this is a big problem for the French. So strategically, the French are going to want to keep it. So our earliest sort of uh, conflict that's going to take place is going to come in what is now western Pennsylvania, uh, near what is now Pittsburgh. And George Washington is leading a patrol of British 
soldiers, and they're into this area, and he assumes that he is in British territory. He looks, you know, they're looking around and saying, hey, what's our map look like? Okay, this is our territory, and we're patrolling it to make sure that the French don't come into it. So he, is, he assumes that he's on his own uh, country's property. He's not. Uh, when he runs into a uh, French patrol, and of course, well, they're invading on English territory, so he orders his men to open fire, uh, thinking, of course, that he's got these guys uh, outnumbered and outgunned, and so he's going to you know, deal these guys with a pretty bad blow, and that will teach them, you know, to stay off of my lawn, or I don't know, something like that. Well, it turns out that, uh, sort of like the scene in Star Wars where Han Solo shoots at a few stormtroopers, chases after them, and runs into a whole hangar full of them, uh, is pretty much what happens here, without the blasters and stormtroopers and stuff like that. Uh, <clears throat> this was, in fact, just a lead element of a much larger French force, and when Washington kind of chases them back, they run into these guys and they turn around and Washington is forced to pull back. He eventually gets uh, cornered, he builds a little fort, Fort Necessity, and eventually he's forced to surrender his troops uh, here in 1753 in western Pennsylvania. But you actually now have uh, British soldiers opening fire on French soldiers uh, in what is French territory, so this looks like an English invasion. And we're going to see now declarations of war. And in a lot of ways, this is kind of the first worldwide war. It doesn't earn the nickname World War, but uh, they're going to be fighting you know, all over the place uh, as a result of this. And eventually the war is going to include, obviously, France. But France is now going to pull in a number of allies. France and its usual ally, Spain, is going to come into this, especially against England. But Russia is also going to come into this as well, <clears throat> along with France is, of course, very sizable Indian allies. Right. Uh, France has the lion's share of alliances amongst the Indian tribes. The Indians generally feel much more comfortable with the French. They would like to see uh, the English colonists, the American English colonists, sort of kept out of their region because these people tend to, you know, they plow under everything, they kick us all out, they fight wars, uh, kill us all, and so we want to keep them out as much as possible. On the other side, you've got Britain and Prussia, which is essentially Germany, right, uh, on their side, and of course. Uh, the American colonists, they're going to come in, uh, they're, they're still you know, British, and they're going to come in on the side uh, of the British uh, as well. And there are a few of the Indian tribes that do side with the British for sort of various reasons, uh, some of which would, uh, if they had signed uh, previous treaties, they say, no, we're, gonna, you know, we're allied with the English. But in a lot of cases, uh, if their mortal enemy tribe uh, were on the side of the uh, French, well, they're not going to fight on that side, they're going to fight on the side of the English. Uh, for that reason uh, as well. And so, <clears throat> what's going to take place here is the British are going to send these redcoats over uh, and they're going to be marching up, especially into upstate New York and various other places. Uh, the American militia is going to then be summoned and they are going to fall in as well. And they're going to be marching off here towards Canada to prosecute the war you know, against the uh, French. Now, a lot of the Americans are kind of, you know, hey, you guys in these wicked, cool, red uniforms need to understand is the way that the Indians fight is really, really different from the way that you Europeans are used to fighting. They're not going to be fighting sort of in open fields, and they're not going to line up. They're going to, they're going to hit us you know, with ambushes, and they're going to try to attack us in the forest, and they're going to come at us from all sides, uh, and it's going to be pretty crazy, and you guys need to be a little more flexible with your tactics. And of course, the uh, British, these guys, you know, we're generals, you guys are a bunch of booger-flicking peasants living in the dirt, you know, here in North America. You don't know anything about warfare. You leave that to us professionals, and of course, uh, this is a good way to get yourself killed. And that's exactly what happens, is uh, the British, they sort of march in, you know, uh, banners flying, that kind of thing, and these Indians and their French allies uh, are going to knock these guys about the head and neck in rather brutal fashion. Uh, They're going to defeat these British guys, and they're going to drive them uh, basically all the way back to uh, the uh, away from the frontiers uh, down to the coastline, and this is going to put things in a pretty bad situation for the American colonists because we're going to see that concomitantly with that, the Indians begin fresh raiding attacks all along the American frontier. Prior to this, <coughs> Indians individual sort of tribes would kind of raid the Americans, and it would, you know, there'd be this sort of raiding war that would take place for a while, and then, you know, the Americans would sort of counterattack, and then uh, there'd be some kind of peace treaty. I don't know, they'd bury a hatchet somewhere, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, it, was, it was episodic, localized, and there was sort of a period for this. 
This is a much larger kind of thing. This is a strategic kind of maneuver that is going to put pressure on the entire American frontier rather than just on uh, specific points. All the way from Canada down to the Carolinas, you're going to see that American frontier settlements are going to get hit, they're going to get caught off guard, and a lot of these colonists are going to get slaughtered. And so these British regular forces, the guys that are supposed to know what they're doing, uh, are going to rout. And this is going to leave George Washington and only about 800 militiamen to defend the entire frontier from Indian and French attacks. And so it, this looks pretty bad. This looks pretty bad. This is a sort of a dark period here uh, in the French and Indian War. Well, what's going to take, uh, what's going to precipitate a change in this is going to be a change politically. Uh, the old prime minister is going to be replaced uh, in London, and William Pitt. And for those of you who are Steelers fans, right, uh, Pittsburgh is named after William Pitt. Uh, he becomes the prime minister uh, after this series of defeats that take place uh, here in America. And so he looks at the situation, and basically Pitt, he was a, you know, he was a mercantilist, uh, he was a money guy, and he looks at the situation and he says, okay, well, what, why are we fighting? We're fighting for money. You know, we're fighting for the fact that North America is a valuable sort of pot of gold. It is the golden goose, and we need to make sure that that thing keeps squeezing out golden eggs, okay? So this is what we're going to fight for, and we're going to adapt our strategy now to meet that goal. We've got a very specific national goal. It isn't just to, we're going to fight the French because we hate them, right? Uh, although they did. Uh, we're going to fight them for a specific goal. So to this end, he raises a huge army. Uh, so our first army gets defeated, fine. We're also going to need to get these guys across the Atlantic, and we're going to need to fight off the French attacks uh, and keep them from reinforcing themselves in North America. So we're going to need a large navy. Bam. No problem. We will do all this in order to fight France. Our main objective is to focus the war effort on winning in North America. Germany, Prussia, you guys, Frederick the Great, who was king of Prussia at this point, you guys are on your own. Here's some cash. Buy some soldiers or guns or whatever, right? And use that then to fight off the French, the Austrians, and the Russians, okay? Uh, you're going to be busy doing the other kind of stuff, and hopefully France will then get bogged down in the fighting in Europe rather than concentrating on North America. This is exactly what happens. We're going to see that the French monarchy at this point becomes consumed with trying to defeat the Germans rather than trying to defeat the English in North America. Now, none of this is free. For those of you who ever tried to buy an army and or a navy, uh, they're pretty expensive, right? Our national credit card, you know, runs up uh, a lot every year. Uh, because this kind of stuff is uh, expensive. And so William Pitt is going to borrow money very, very heavily in order to pay for these military assets that he feels are necessary in order to win the war. However, the idea was, well, once the war is over, we'll be able to use the economic resources that we have available here in North America to pay off these debts that we incur. So we're going to see that basically all the things that William Pitt uh, puts into the war effort are going to turn out to be correct. All right. uh, Pitt's army arrives and it reinvigorates the, uh, the struggle here in North America. And we're going to see it's going to maintain some of the Indian tribes' loyalty. These guys are kind of shaky. Do we want to defect now? Do we want to just sort of stay neutral uh, in this? And we're going to see it's going to be very, very effective. And of course, the uh, British Navy are going to do a pretty good job of cutting off reinforcements of the French to reach uh, North America. Well, also while many of these frontier attacks had uh, taken the American colonists uh, sort of by surprise and killed a lot of these guys all along the frontier. And during this period, you know, the Indians are probably pretty pleased with themselves. Hey, this is, this is a lot of fun. You know, we all sort of join one giant war party. The uh, colonists can't concentrate on any one of us. Well, what's good for the goose is also good for the gander. And as we're going to see, as these Americans sort of, they, they get pushed back and they kind of backpedal and then they catch their breath, they're going to form very large colonial militias and they're going to take the fight to the Indians themselves. And this fighting, this frontier fighting that takes place, you know, around the, uh, you know, the Appalachian Mountains and uh, the Adirondacks and some of these places, uh, you know, around uh, Kentucky and, and some other places, is pretty brutal. It's pretty nasty kind of stuff. With uh, these uh, Indian villages being raided, you know, women and children being killed or hauled off. A lot of these guys are going to get dismembered and cut up. Uh, and it's going to send a pretty strong message to the Indian tribes that the American colonists they don't play around. Uh, it's ugly, dirty, nasty kind of stuff. Uh, with all the charm of a bar fight, and 
uh, eventually what we're going to see is a lot of these Indians, uh, these American Indians are going to decide, you know what, uh, this isn't worth it. <laughs> Our treaty with the French was a lot of fun uh, at the beginning when we were getting guns and we were catching all these frontier sort of isolated communities kind of off guard. But now that the American militia is together and is organized and they're attacking us and they're blowing us away, I don't think so. And a lot of these guys are going to break their alliance with the French and they're going to retreat away from the frontier, which of course is going to free up a lot of these people to go and attack the uh, French in Canada. And that's exactly what's going to take place here. The British are going to send forces and they're going to recapture Louisbourg, which essentially now is going to cut off reinforcements from coming up the uh, St. Lawrence River. And they are then going to move into the heart of uh, French territory and they're going to attack Quebec, which is now the city of Montreal. Right? The British and the American forces are going to attack Quebec from across the river, a rather stunning sort of spectacular victory. Uh, the uh, French had figured that the Americans and the, uh, the British would attack them uh, on the northern side uh, of the city that they come across over a nice flat kind of open area and they had deployed their forces uh, there as well. Instead, they attacked them to the south side of the city. but. They had to climb up these huge cliffs. They had to get across the river in some fog. And then, of course, they had to form up on the other side. But they managed to do it. They catch the French off guard. The French don't have enough forces in, in that part of the battlefield in order to do anything about it. And then by the time they do figure out the Americans are there and the British are there, uh, these guys have enough forces uh, mustered to kind of drive these guys off. And with Quebec gone, the sort of the middle pin uh, of the entire French defensive network is going to go apart. And... This is going to allow them now to move up and down the St. Lawrence River at will and capturing French forts and outposts uh, and eventually taking over all of Canada. All right, so the big winner, the big winner here uh, in the uh, French and Indian War by far is going to be Britain. Or is it? Let's talk specifics before we go bananas, okay? The British are going to win Canada. They're going to capture it. They're going to get to keep it uh, at the end of that uh, conflict as well. Florida is going to come as a result of the peace deal because the British Navy had helped uh, capture Cuba, had captured Havana, Cuba, which was the capital of Spain's overseas empire. And so basically they said, uh, the Spanish said, okay, look, we've got to have Cuba back. We really, really need it. And the British were like, hey, give us Florida and we'll, we'll you know, we'll give, you, we'll give you Cuba back. So, okay. Uh, the Spanish had fought long and hard to maintain their uh, colony here in Florida. But while they would have really, really liked to have had Florida, they had to have Cuba. So they traded Florida for Cuba, and so the British are going to pick this up as well. And, of course, colonists are now going to be able to move into the Ohio River Valley uh, as well. Spain is rather upset that it winds up on the losing end uh, of this proposition, this war uh, against the English. And, you know, they turn to their French allies, and they say, oh, fight against England, you said. It will be easy, you said. France... Uh, is forced then to cough up Louisiana to the Spanish as compensation for uh, Spain's alliance during the war. <clears throat> so now we've got no enemy barriers to prevent American expansion into the Ohio Valley, something that uh, American colonists had sort of uh, cast lustful eyes onto for decades. The fertile Ohio River Valley is now open to expansion for them. And you've got a pretty impressive change in terms of the two maps when you look at these. Uh, this is the map here, 1713, uh, prior to these major sort of wars of uh, colonial expansion. And uh, you've got the sort of British here, British up there. But, you know, a lot of the continent has been claimed by France and, of course, uh, Spain. And then you fast forward to 1763, 50 years later, and major, major change as a result of that. You basically got you know, the uh, British to go almost from the North Pole down to the Straits of Florida. Unabated, they control uh, the eastern half of the North American continent. Uh, Louisiana does go over to Spain and eventually will later revert back to France. Uh, but now we've got some real opportunities here for these American colonists because now the, the barrier of French... Uh, intervention in their colonial activities, stirring up the Indians against them, that, that's, that's removed, right? So everything should be just perfect and happy. Well, not quite, okay? So <clears throat> we're going to see that a lot of problems are actually going to come for the American colonists as a result of the French and Indian War. A lot of big, big changes uh, as a result of that. One of the problems that uh, took place during the French and Indian War 
uh, as a result uh, of fighting alongside the British was the Americans are generally pretty badly treated uh, by British officers. They're for the most part viewed as an inferior sort of rabble. And the reason for that is you've got two societies now that for uh, really 150 years almost have kind of evolved along separate tracks. The British, they're coming from settled, you know, England, and it's got its society and its laws and its rules and its customs, and it's kind of put together in a certain way. And the way that that society is put together, especially in terms of the military, is the officers are the genteel class. They're the people that are born to positions of importance, or they may work their way up into the officer ranks, but generally speaking, it took a little bit of money in order to be able to do that if you weren't born into the right families. So generally speaking, what you've got is a little middle upper, but for the most part, upper classes of society that dominate the officer ranks uh, of the British Army, and then you're going to have the people that are the regular soldiers that are pretty much from the bottom. Uh, it was not uncommon for uh, these people that, well, I can't really find a job, I can't really do anything else in society, and uh, I'm going to, I'll join the Army, okay? It was also not uncommon in some cases for judges to, uh, in criminal cases, well, I could send you to jail, or instead of, if you don't want to do that, you can join the British Army. So, which is not to say that everybody, uh, you know, in the British Army at this point is, you know, sort of a sociopathic reprobate. Uh, there are a lot of people that are, you know, pretty far down the social scale, and they know that they're never going to get out of that. They're, they're always going to be kind of at the bottom of society. They're in the Army. The Army sucks. And, you know, it's really not a whole lot of fun. And they're treated like that. The British, you know, officers, we're up here, you guys are down there, and you're, you know, you're human trash. Okay, right? So naturally they assume that when they're serving alongside the American militia, well, they dress like farmers, and their vocabulary is kind of rough, and they drink liquid corn. These guys are they're sort, of the, sort of the same kind of inferior trash that, you know, populates most of our army. But, in fact, what you're going to see is a lot of these Americans, they really resented that uh, because, well, yeah, we're sort of frontier folk, but we're independent. We're our own sort of business people. We own farms. We're colonizing a continent. We're bringing civilization to a place that essentially is devoid of it. And so while we may sort of look and talk one way, socially, our structure is very different. We you know, believe in sort of equality and egalitarianism. And... You guys don't understand that. We usually need to treat us like equals. Well, of course, you know, the British, what? You know, that's sort of a foreign concept. And so they really, really chafed under British command uh, in the American, uh, the French and Indian War here in America. Also, one of the other problems that beset these colonies is a lot of these colonies, uh, individual colonies, sort you know, South Carolina, Virginia, um, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts. All these colonies, they sort of treated themselves like little independent countries uh, in a lot of ways. Socially, uh, they found huge differences between themselves and neighboring colonies. Uh, almost like you would see uh, in Europe where you know, you've got these sort of tiny little countries that are all right next to each other. They all speak sort of different languages. They have different religions. And, you know, oh, you're, you're a foreigner. You're from someplace else. And so these colonies really had a uh, suspicious kind of uh, you know, entity for each other. They didn't really get along. They, they felt they were all different. Uh, and, of course, that, that harkens back to the fact that some of these colonies were started due to religious differences, in some cases with people of different colonies. Uh, they had different you know, economic charters. They had uh, you know, different, different economic activities, uh, views on social structure. And as a result of that, they found that many of these differences, oh, they, we're just incompatible with each other. Yeah, we're all part of the British Empire, but you know, we are very, very different than the people in the colony next to us. And so... They found, though, that in serving in the French and Indian War, one of the things that you do is, you know, you build up camaraderie. You sit around the campfire and you start talking about, hey, well, this is what's going on here in my colony. Well, hey, that's sort of going on in my colony as well. And now I'm not going to tell you that the French and Indian War just sort of melted all the barriers between the different colonies and got rid of all this internecine strife that they had with each other, because that would be false. However it did help begin to build these bridges between these colonists who served in the French and Indian War and is going to become very, very handy 20 years later uh, when the American Revolution begins to roll around that they realize, you know, actually we do have a lot in common, okay? We're also going to see that in 1763 the British Parliament uh, begins to intervene here socially 
uh, in the American colonial activities when it issues the Proclamation of 1763. And that is related to uh, this red line on this map here, which was that the British Parliament said, okay, no settlement west of this line. What? Are you sure that the whole reason we were really interested was so that we could get into this part here, right there, west of that line there? And the reason for this is the British government is looking at ways to cut costs. Uh, the war had been very, very expensive, and they're worried that American colonists moving into this region will upset the Indians, which it will, right? Uh, and so they don't want to have to pay the extra money in order to send more troops, more uh, law enforcement people over in order to keep the Indians off the colonists' backs. So, hey, you guys need to stop here, and we're going to let the Indians sort of you know, be in this area. But to the Americans, no. Westward expansion, west of the Appalachian Mountains, west of the Adirondacks, that's, that's how we have to live. See, the way that it works is we live here. We crank out these huge families, and then they're going to need land to live on, and so we send them out to the frontier in order to claim this land, and if you take that away from us, then our whole society is going to fall apart. That may be kind of an exaggeration, and a lot of historians have kind of pointed that out, but a lot of Americans believe it, whether it's an exaggeration uh, or not. So what's going to happen, though, is a lot of these colonists basically you know, go, I don't think so. Uh, they blatantly ignore the rule. And they are going to cross uh, the Appalachian Mountains in ever-increasing numbers, led by guys like you know, Daniel Boone through the Cumberland Gap uh, here into uh, you know, eastern Tennessee, Kentucky, you know, that kind of area. Uh, this is actually a pretty good uh, artist rendering of what Daniel Boone looked like uh, at this point. Uh, it is a myth that he wore a coonskin cap. However, it is such a pervasive myth that I have to include. This is Fess Parker from the 1960s TV show. Uh, with Daniel Boone wearing a, fur, uh, a coonskin fur cap. So one of the other issues that is taking place here, uh, putting Americans on the wrong side uh, of the law, was smuggling. And this was the fact that uh, when you're at war, uh, trading with various people or trading without paying customs duties uh, is illegal. And so these Americans realized that, uh, just like sort of drug smugglers uh, do today, that if you've got a product and it's illegal, uh, you can uh, sell it for tremendous amounts of profit if you're willing to run the risk of being pinched by the law. And so smuggling is going to go way up during a war, and Americans are going to get pretty comfortable with the idea that, you know, British law is really more of a suggestion than an actual set uh, of rules, right? <clears throat> so this is, that was sort of the, sort of the co course of major kind of events. We talked a little bit about um, the economical side and social side, but I want to get into a few specific points uh, with society and with economics now. And one of these is the growing idea of uh, republicanism uh, in America by the mid 1700s. Now, don't get confused with the political party of the same name. We've got you know uh, two political parties in the Democrats and the Republicans. They've taken two sort of ideas and they've made them a specific name, right? So don't get confused when I talk about republicanism that I mean you know, the political party with the same name. Right? And what we're going to see, though, is the rise of republicanism uh, here in uh, America by the mid-1700s so that it becomes sort of the assumed you know, kind of way of putting society together. Uh, at the heart of this, of course, is going to be the Enlightenment. The growth of the Enlightenment throughout the middle 1700s uh, is going to play a big factor here in terms of thinking about society, using reason, using those ideas uh, in order to put society together. But we're also going to see a number of political and social issues that are going to push Americans toward this belief uh, in terms of egalitarianism, which is the idea that well, basically everybody is equal. And you wouldn't see necessarily everybody in America sort of totally buy into that, but at the heart of it, it was sort of more or less true, even among sort of the wealthy kind of elite. Uh, here in America, and the idea that you know, well, we all are sort of equal, and eventually this kind of language would find its uh, ultimate sort of voice in the Declaration of Independence, the um, U.S. Constitution, documents like that. But the idea of a Republican idea, the idea that the uh, public is going to rule, res publica, right? And this is an ideal society that these people had uh, sort of in mind. So in this, everyone is equal, and the individual is more important than the state. This, of course, sort of flips most governments of the world at that point, 
some still today at this point, uh, the idea, the concept of social organization kind of on its head. The state is the most important. Uh, you know, Hitler in Nazi Germany. No, the state. You've got to subsume. It doesn't matter about your rights and liberties and things like that. Eh, it's a bunch of hooey. You know, the state is what's important. You know, everybody does whatever they got to do. And if it means you got to go off and get murdered, fine. You as the individual is not important. The group is what's important, right? Here in America, the 1700s, ever increasingly no. The individual. The individual is what's important. Because if the individual can be oppressed by the state, or can be cracked down, or can be destroyed, then all of us can. So this is very much a bottom-up view of society, rather than a top-down view. Right? Now, one of the things, like I mentioned before, you would see some uncomfortable um, feelings on the part of some of these sort of upper-crust kind of leaders in America. They didn't trust sort of the you know, uh, people in the streets, and that kind of thing. But one of the truisms that was uh, evident here in America, much more so than you would find in concomitant, say, European societies, was that the social classes under a Republican uh, society, they're permeable. Meaning that you may be born poor, but through you know, hard work, sound investing, you know, uh, marriage connection, you know, whatever, you can move up the social scale. You may wind up sort of middle class by the time uh, you die, and your children then may have, an, or your grandchildren may have access then to the upper uh, classes of society. So social advancement is possible under a Republican society. Everybody's equal. Everybody has an equal shot. It doesn't mean that everybody will all be sort of uh, super duper wealthy, but everybody has a chance at it. Okay. That also means that the lines of deference are impermanent. So while we may look at society at whatever point in history and you say, oh well, that guy he's really important. He's wealthy and politically powerful and stuff like that. But that doesn't mean that three generations later, his great-grandkid is going to be wealthy and powerful, and that my great-grandkid is still going to be, you know, sort of poor and dirt farming and stuff like that, uh, that things are going to change. In fact, they may invert uh, in terms of change over time. So unlike Europe, where if you're, you know, Duke Tuttlebutt or whatever, and your great-grandkid, he's going to be the, you know, the Duke Tuttlebutt of his time, and the people who live in the village, they always have to, oh, you know, Duke Tuttlebutt, you know, hey, how are you doing? And you know, their great grandkids, right? Hey, oh, the new Duke Tunnel Butt, right? You know, whatever, right? Uh, that's never going to change under that kind of situation. Under Republicanism, uh, society is what you make of it. Uh, the idea of a merit based society, everybody has an equal shot. Uh, this is where this ever increasingly is going to come from in American society. Now, in terms of the economic changes, we're going to see it's dominated here by uh, a system that we as historians would call mercantilism, okay? And the genesis of this really comes from Britain itself. And the basis of its colonial rule was it's going to impose a mercantile system that would be profitable for them. Normally, what you're going to do is any kind of trade exchange, if I'm going to trade you $50 worth of goods, you've got to trade me $50 worth of your goods. Because if we don't, if I give you 100 and you only give me 50 then either I'm a sucker or you're a thief. right? And if you just keep doing this, where I give you more, then I'm going to wind up with less. And there's just, there's just no way to do this in the long term. But this was a system that Britain had kind of set up, that we're the mother country, we're the colonial power, we protect all of you guys with our mighty army and navy. And so as a result of that, every economic activity that we have our fingers in, and a lot of them uh, we're getting uh, fingers put into them, uh, needs to benefit us. It's not going to be an even exchange uh, in terms of economic activity, right? Now, the problem with this, of course, is ignoring the long-term political consequences. You keep basically taking people's stuff, and you stack the game so that you always win, and people are going to get ticked. And in this case, politically, if they determine that, well, you know, being a part of the British Empire means that you just get screwed economically, maybe we ought to not be part of the British Empire anymore. So that, those are some logical conclusions that a lot of people are eventually uh, going to uh, come to. Like I said, mercantilism is this idea that the mother country has the benefit from all of these exchanges. Now, what we're going to see here specifically in terms of the mercantilist relationship between England and her North American colonies is that raw materials are going to come into England from North America. So you'll see you know, indigo, rice, tobacco, uh, you know, timber, hemp line, all this kind of stuff. It's going to come into the country and then they are going to get manufactured. All the raw materials are going to get manufactured into products that are then going to be re-exported back to the colonies, 
right? But the colonies can only then basically buy from the home country. So you've got a monopoly that the home country has set up for itself to benefit itself. <clears throat> when we get into some specifics about how a mercantilist system works, you're going to see a series of navigation acts are going to be passed uh, by the British Parliament uh, over the course of the series uh, of uh, over the course of time. It's going to take place. And this is the specific, this is kind of the nuts and bolts of how mercantilism was supposed to work. And this was designed for the English to be able to monopolize the American uh, commerce trades. All right? First, all goods had to be transported on British or American ships. It didn't matter if the Dutch or the French trading vessel was going to give you a better shipping rate than the British trade vessel. Uh, you had to use the British one. You could also use an American ship, but because Americans you know, were... British at this point. Anyway, uh, the idea was you're going you're to keep it all in-house, okay? That the only American or British workers are going to benefit uh, from these uh, trades. Okay, you know, that's, probably at some point, you know, it's going to cost you some money, but, you know, maybe it will rationalize and say, well, you know, we're kicking some money, you know, buying local or whatever, right? All goods had to pass through Britain. So, let's say you've got a buyer in France and you wanted to sell your product from America to the French. No, you can't do that. It's got to make a stopover in Britain. The British are going to assess a tax on it. Also, British workers are going to then load it off of your ship and then load it back onto either your ship or a different ship after the, the taxes have been assigned on it. And so uh, this is going to put British workers, uh, of course, uh, employed, and you're going to have to pay them. So this greatly increases your cost. And you can see already where the temptation to smuggle is going to come from. Well, you know, if I skip the part where I stop in England, I'll be able to lower my price, I'll be able to increase my profits, I'll be able to put my competitor out of business. There are a whole bunch of business options that now uh, are open to somebody who's willing to uh, play a little fast and loose uh, with the law. Now, some specific American products, like tobacco, they could only be sold in England. It didn't matter if the Spanish were going to give you a good price on your tobacco and a, and a few other things like naval stores that the British Navy needed. It didn't matter how much money you were going to make uh, from some of the European country. You had to sell it in England to whatever price the English were willing to give you. So, you know, tough. That's just the way that it goes. So, again, ever increasingly, hmm, you know, if I don't get caught by the law, I can sell some of these things that other countries have to buy from the English rather than from me, hmm, that's a good chance to make yourself a lot of money. <clears throat> and so what you're going to see is all this begins to sort of pile up, and a bunch of these American colonial legislatures, they get together and they say, what? You know, none of this makes any sense. Obviously, the, the Parliament didn't have, they didn't have us in mind. They didn't have us in mind when they passed these kinds of, we here in Virginia or Pennsylvania or, you know, where. Uh, we're much more responsible. We're, we're, we're okay. And so they passed this, uh, a number of acts saying, uh, no, we're not going to follow this specific one. That, that's not going to be enforced here. And the idea was, basically, they were placing their colonial legislature on the same level as the British Parliament in London. Because, well, we defer to the king. So does Parliament. Parliament's under, Parliament's under the king. We're under the king. But Parliament's not over us. Oh, contraire, Parliament reminds them. Because after a series of these acts uh, passed in American colonial legislatures to basically repeal parts of the Navigation Acts that the colonies found um, odious, the Parliament reminded them, hey, we're in charge here. We run England and her empire, which includes your stupid behind. And so England then reserved the right to nullify any American law. Wait a second. So our democratic process that we've had going for like a century and a half in some cases now, you guys are going to come in and any law that you don't like, you can get rid of. Yeah, that's right, buddy. So you can see now that tensions are really beginning to rise as we go throughout the 1700s. One of the major factors here, as I've mentioned repeatedly, is smuggling. Okay? Now, one of the things you, you uh, need to understand is that if you read some of the sort of American propagandist you know, apologies to you know, sort of literature of the you know, 1760s and things like that, uh, is that, well, everything that England did, you know, is bad. You know, you get a hold of, like, you know, um, Samuel Adams and some of these other guys, um, you know, really sort of hot-headed um, American revolutionary kind of thing. There were a few parts of the Navigation Act that were somewhat beneficial to the Americans, you know, uh, you know, 
going only on uh, English ships, for example, that's going to uh, get you a lot of uh, respect, uh, respect and uh, protection from the British Navy. Uh, you know, they are being a part of the most powerful and most effective trading network uh, in the world. But generally, feel the uh, colonists are increasingly feel like their children. Britain is their mother, and of course, they're forcing them into a series of economic deals that are costing them lots and lots of money. So they got some serious problems with uh, a lot of this, right? Because the acts they serve to stifle competition with other nations, and competition uh, is going to uh, sort of break up the British monopoly. So. But the only way that this worked is if the Navigation Act were followed strictly. Okay, so Americans they would routinely skirt the laws. All right, they smuggled to other countries. Uh, they would sort of skip, you know, the British phase of this. They would go to a place. They would have fake logs in their ship. Oh yeah, we didn't pay the taxes here, and we did that there. They would have secret compartments uh, in their. Uh, ships to where if a tax inspector did come on board, oh, look, all the stuff that we have is legal and we've got the tax documents to prove it. And then, of course, you know, you got a giant thing of tobacco maybe under the floorboards or something like that. So, uh, whatever way you did it, uh, smuggling against a system that they thought was wrong and ever increasingly wrong, it didn't seem wrong. Okay? So, one of the problems that, that every society has is people breaking the law. Okay, uh, there, there's, uh, people always find sort of advantages, personal advantages rather than social advantages, to breaking the law, whether it's you know, murdering or stealing or whatever, right? But you run into huge social problems, though, when you've got a large number of people that break the law and, and feel justified in doing so. Th this is a big issue. Uh, you know, the guy who sort of smacks you on top of the head and steals your wallet, he kind of knows that when the cops come and get him, you know, okay, yeah, I, I smacked him on the head and I took his wallet, okay? Uh, a lot of these smugglers, they know that they're going to come and, uh, you know, the, the, the law is going to come after them, but they, they feel like, you know, this is my business, and it's the law that's wrong. So this is, this is a huge problem when it gets to sort of epidemic uh, proportions. Britain tries to stop this practice by setting up a series of what they call uh, admiralty courts, all right? And these admiralty courts were uh, set up to try to curtail and go after and convict uh, American smugglers, okay? And the judge, basically, uh, of these admiralty courts was presided by a uh, British naval officer. So this is not a civilian judge. This is a guy who's in the military. Moreover, this is not a guy who would, if you're caught, you know, sort of smuggling stuff, you know, into or out of Boston, you would expect to be put on trial in Boston. That's where the, the crime took place. No, you would have been hauled off to one of the colonial military outposts in Canada, probably Nova Scotia, and put on trial there. Now, the naval officer, not only is he not a civilian, and he, they're not even in America, okay, you've been hauled, literally hauled off uh, to some other place, this was a guy who, if he found you guilty and said, yep, you've been smuggling tobacco or rice or those little squinky things, whatever, it doesn't matter what it is, um, if I find you guilty, I get a percentage of the seized cargo as a reward for ferreting out smugglers. So he has a vested economic interest in not finding you not guilty. Right? He, he's got a, he gets paid to find you guilty. And moreover, because it's a military court and not a civil criminal court, most of the laws of civil you know, criminal procedure just sort of go away. Right? A military court, you know, the guy... Conceivably, he can act as uh, the prosecuting attorney, the judge, and the jury, sort of all by itself. And he just asked him, hey, did you do it? No, I don't believe you. Guilty. That's sort of an extreme case, but conceivably, it's possible, okay, to how this uh, could go. Of course, he gets paid uh, if he finds you guilty, okay? So he's got a, he's got a pretty extreme uh, economic advantage in order to... Uh, or incentive to do this, right? Now, the reason for this, for those of you who just, you know, sort of you're, you're at home or wherever you're watching the video, uh, sort of sharpening your knot, how dare they, right? You're still mad about this like 200 years later. Um, this setup was designed to get Britain uh, some convictions because these guys, these defendants, would go on trial in Boston, you know, or Jamestown or, you know, some of these other, you know, sort of colonial port facilities. And the people that are put on these juries are often a lot of other sort of sea captains and smugglers. 
And, you know, they sit there and they listen to this evidence in this civil trial. And, you know, so I caught him with this big bag of weed or something. A uh, giant bag of tobacco, and he didn't have the taxes paid on it, and you know, caught him here, and caught him there, and caught him this way, and caught him that way, and there's a giant mountain of evidence. All right, jury, what do you think? I'm not guilty, Your Honor. You know, so ever increasingly, these colonial juries were basically just straight up refusing to convict smugglers. You know, because they didn't agree with the navigation acts. They thought smuggling was just cool. You know, hey, look, this is the only way to make money. You guys in Britain need to wise up, right? So. This was, this was a way to get around that. Okay, we'll put them on military trial, breaking these sort of military rules of the sea. And so we're going to get them out of you know, these uh, sort of smuggler hotbeds, and we'll put them on trial, and we'll get some, uh, uh, we'll get some convictions out of it. Now, to the Americans, though, this really sort of stepped on their sense of fair play. You've got civilians being on trial uh, by military. There's no jury far off from home. The judge gets paid if he is... Uh, if the guy's found guilty, so there's going to be a significant amount of increasing outrage uh, as a uh, result of that, right? When we also look at the economic front, we're going to see that uh, ever increasingly a series of taxes are, are going to get enacted. And basically all of it has one root cause, and that is the fact that Britain is broke from the French and Indian War. It bet the farm, or at least mortgaged the farm, uh, on winning the French and Indian War with the idea that uh, economic success uh, after the war in North America would then pay for it. So now they've reached, they've, they've passed the won the war phase, and now they're into the pay for it stage. And so they're turning their attention here on the North American colonists to pay for this. And they had a decent sort of line of reasoning, which is that most of the money that was spent during the war was spent on defending North America and the North American colonies. So it doesn't seem like too outrageous an idea to look at the colonists and say, okay, you guys. Uh, we've paid all this money. You guys have now your, still your colonies. The French didn't come in and kill you and sort of stick their tongues in your mouth or whatever it is that French people do. So as a result of that, you guys need to help us pay off this war debt. The British people back home, they're taxed to the hilt. We squeeze them anymore. We won't get money out of them. They'll just, their heads will pop. You know? So you guys have got to start uh, paying some taxes. Now, of course, your average sort of colonist is sort of doing the math on this and they're saying, you know, the Navigation Acts are already costing us huge amounts of our huge percentages of our income anyway they're not called taxes but you know enforced monopolies are taking money out of our pockets anyway so when these taxes begin to sort of roll down on top of them they are going to look at this and say okay already the money that we're losing essentially with the navigation acts with mercantilism we're not going to pay taxes on top of that uh, as well so parliament is going to go uh, into uh, it's sort of taxing mode, and there are going to be a series of acts, starting with a tax on sugar to offset uh, the costs. Now, a lot of uh, sugar, for the most part, is coming out uh, in the raw. It's coming out of the Caribbean. It's being sent to England, and then it's being sort of refined and manufactured, and then it would be sold back to the Americans to put into their tea or to feed to their horses as a treat, or uh, you could pretend it's cocaine. I don't know, whatever it is you do with sugar uh, here at this point, uh, here in the 1700s. Now, What's going to happen here is throughout this series of events, what you're going to see is there's going to be an action by Parliament and then a surprised reaction by the colonists. Meaning that Parliament's going to send a message. They're going to send sort of message A. And the American colonists are going to receive message B. So when the Parliament sends out this thing, hey, well, there's this itty bitty tax that we want to add to sugar, and it's really not that big of a deal. You guys need to uh, you know, help sort of pay off you know, the debts from the war that, for the most part, benefited you. Um, so you know, here's this tax. The message received by the colonists is, we're already paying a ton of money for uh, you know, these navigation acts. It's really costing us a lot of our business, and now there's this tax that none of us got to vote on anyway dumped on us. And so there's going to be protests. The colonists are going to protest, and Parliament's rather surprised. Whoa! Right? Whoa! It's sort of like in the middle of winter when you're walking along, you grab the doorknob and it snaps static electricity on your hand. Whoa! All right. Parliament is going to relent. Okay, we're going to lower the tax. So now we had a couple of things. For those of you who studied psychology, all right, uh, classical conditioning has taken place here. Colonists are going to protest, and they're going to be rewarded by getting what they want, which is a lowering of the tax. 
So they have now been encouraged to protest again. And that's exactly what's going to take place uh, ever increasingly. So Parliament isn't quite finished with their taxation, though, because they've got to find a way to make up for this lost revenue. So the next one is going to be the Quartering and the Stamp Acts. Now, the Quartering Act uh, called for colonists to provide food and houses for British soldiers who were operating in the area uh, to put them up. You know, and putting these soldiers up is expensive, and so you guys have places to stay at inns or warehouses or whatever, so we're going to have uh, British soldiers stay with you and eat your food. This is not terribly popular with the colonists. It's about as much fun as... You know, if some dude in the army or police officer or something like that, he sort of kicked in your door and they're like, hey, you know, it's expensive for me to stay somewhere. Uh, I'm going to live with you. Great. Right? So uh, this, is, this is extremely unpopular uh, with the colonists, despite the fact that most of these colonists have never had to actually put up a, uh, a soldier in their house. Uh, the thought that it could happen really bothered them. Okay? But what you're going to see here is, uh, on the revenue front, is Parliament is going to pass what they call the Stamp Act. All right? And this is a little hard for us to understand now because most people, your, your sort of involvement with stamps is if you still like send stuff through the, like the regular mail, which is sort of quaint, like making your own cheese or something, you know? It's like, oh, I sent a letter through the mail, you know? Uh, but, you know, you buy a stamp and you sort of, you get it and it costs however many, you know, uh, cents. And you pay for it, and you stick it on the front of the, you know, the letter, and you drop it in a little slot. Nobody, so there aren't like riots in the, you know, riots in the post office. It just that cost how much? And then you sort of throttle the, you know, the guy wearing the blue jacket behind the, the desk. And it doesn't happen, at least not usually. Um, so the reason for that is, you know, you're getting service, right? You know, you, you buy the stamp, and then you get, you're buying the, hey, somebody's going to carry your letter or whatever to wherever it's going. And so you, you don't feel bad about it. You might complain that it's too expensive or something, but uh, you understand that, okay, I'm buying a service for this, all right? This is very different than the Stamp Act and what it required, okay? You go and you buy something at the store, you know, a newspaper pack of playing cards or something like that, and it costs, you know, how much it costs a dollar, and you bring it to the counter, and it's, oh, the law requires that I stamp this now with an official government stamp so that the government will know it's official. Bam, now it's $1.25. Wait, what? Yeah. It costs more now that it has the official government stamp on it, which I'm required to put on there, and so you've got to pay for it. So I've got to pay for a little smudge of ink now that's on my product that I wanted to buy here at the store. Yes, it costs more now because I had to stamp it. There's no benefit that you get from the stamp. I mean, some of them, they're, they're pretty cool looking. I mean, you know, if you like looking at stamps, if you're a stamp collector or something. Uh, but for the most part, it adds no value to this. And there was a lot of stamps that went on just like everything, and it was really, really stupid. So this is gonna, uh, this is gonna generate a strong series of protests all around America, and it's gonna have two precipitate uh, actions that's gonna take place as a result of that. One, it forces Parliament to repeal the Stamp Act. You notice those of you who are psychology majors out there, like they reinforced the behavior again. Yes, they did. It gives them what they want. Second. It unites a lot of the colonies behind the cause of standing up to Parliament for their principles. All right? Through the, throughout these acts, during these protests, ever increasingly you're going to see one of the coolest little slogans ever in American history that begins to find some traction uh, that very simply and effectively states many Americans' opposition to these taxes, which is no taxation without representation. And I think that this is a good, much, a good point to stop uh, as any.